Okay, so um, we have uh, now, now until uh, quarter past ten for our first session this morning, panel four, translating autobiographies. And uh, it's my great pleasure to uh, welcome uh, Jadip Sadanji um, from the Jogis Ch uh, Chandra Chaudhary College um, at Calcutta University to give our first presentation this morning. Um, it's a, a presentation with the title Translation as Commitment with a Purpose, a close study of a translation project involving Bengali autobiography into English. And I think you're going to begin actually by launching the book. Uh, so we, we've got a, a book launch this morning as well. Good morning to all of you. And uh, before I begin, I'll be talking about the book, the first uh, Bengali Dalit uh, autobiography into English. And uh, in my paper, I'll be discussing, because there are a lot of uh, discussions and throughout uh, half a century more, the Marathi Dalit literature, Marathi uh, Tamil Dalit literature, Karnat Dalit literature, and Bengali Dalit literature is not much heard in that way. But uh, there are a whole lot of books which talk about 100 years of Bengali literature. So uh, it is uh, an important book, I think, because the uh, first Bengali Dalit literature or Bengali Dalit uh, autobiography into English. So before I begin, it's an honor to me that I launch the book here. So the first copy I give it to uh, Professor Duncan Lard. <laughs> Place of honor in the BCLT library. Thank you so much. Yeah, short sure. 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 yeah. yeah. sure. 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 yeah. sure. 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 I know there are a whole lot of discussions on Dalit literature, what is Dalit literature, characteristics of Dalit literature, and all that. Therefore, this part is very brief part for me, and there are a couple of angles that I want to set up. Therefore, this part has been incorporated. But my focus is on Bengali Dalit literature, and with specific reference to the book that I, along with Professor Ramgona Dasto, translated recently, and which was ceremoniously launched here. And thank you for giving it, uh, giving the platform to me. Dangle defining uh, Dalit literature, Dalit literature is not simply a literature, it is associated with a movement to bring about change. And we have a lot of papers dealing with this change. It is strongly evident that there is no established critical theory behind, within bracket, Dalit writings. Instead, there is a new thinking and a new point of view, Dangle in 1994. Though the term Dalit literature can be traced to the first Dalit literary conference in 1958 in the state of Maharashtra. However, the literature by the Dalits was being produced right from the 1920s as far as a rough record goes. I know there are debates that it goes back to uh, 100,000 years. It seems that those who claim for a Dalit language they confuse the language with the Dalit experience. The Dalits are determined to narrate the Dalit agony, resistance, strains, and power <coughs> of liberation. It is important to note here that while responding to the past experiences, the Dalit writers are conscious of the present and give hint to the future prosperity. These make a fervent plea for the complete overall society by questioning prevailing practices of caste and class in different parts of India. Why do you write your autobiography? Uh, Dr. Sharangi, I extend my thanks to you first. Then I try to tell to you why I have written my autobiography. You know, in the field of writing, I have passed more than three decades sincerely and continuously I have written in different genres, different books have been published by this time. So far the books have come to life. There are four books of poems, one book of short story, and six books on 
he says, all thy sins, what I have written here, are all about the Dolit people. Why I have written I have done? Because I think a person should write the thing what he knows well. Since I am from the Dolit background, I have used my total writing period about the Dolit in the form of short stories, in the form of essays, in the form of poems. And what I have felt at the again, now I have 71, people should know why I have written all these things about the Dolit. Naturally, my own autobiography should explain the thing, should say the thing, the background where I have come, I have come. That is the reason why I have written my autobiography explaining my childhood, why I have been a child never in the agricultural field, and where from it was very, very difficult to come up in life. I have a plan. I will write the second part, and every if I get time, I will also write the third part of it, explain the whole experiences of my life. There are a lot of experiences I have gathered in my life, only a, a small portion of it, very particularly the portion attached to it my childhood is given in this autobiography. Uh, next time I will do another things another more things where I will write the experiences of the next life. Bengali Dolit literature and its movement, it will, it will, it will get a very good, good position, good impression amongst the readers of Dolit literature. I have seen our writers from the Dolit people, they have started their writing 100 years back. It is not very much known to all the people. That's why just two years back I had compiled a book that is 100 years of Bengali Dalit literature. I have incorporated in that book. The book, uh, if we look into the chapters, we have a, a note to the Bengali calendar at the beginning. The dialogic process thus moves outside the text. The textuality of the translated text is a composite in which a cross-cultural dialogue marks a space of complicity and confrontation. In terms of the actor's positions taken by the translator, the gender paradigm is based on identity formation and group affiliations. The focus of my presentation is on two Dalit women's autobiographies in Marathi Gina Amsa by Baby Kamde, translated as The Prisons We Broke, and Urmila Pawar's Aidan, translated as The Week of My Life. Both brilliant translations in English by the intellectual, academic, Maharashtrian, non Dalit social activist, poet, and leftist committed to the cause of the amelioration of the pain and humiliation suffered through centuries. Since the 1960s, the social literary phenomenon of Dalit literature marks a significant trend in Marathi literature in Maharashtra. The Dalit autobiographies are a part of social discourse. These narratives can be studied historically as a cultural performance, linguistically as a text, psychologically as an act of cognition to include memory, self-analysis and personality construction. His book, Slavery, again translated by Maya Pandit, is dedicated the, to the good people of the United States for the cause of Negro slavery. This shows the broad sweep of his vision and the stoicism of his philosophy of life. Following in the footsteps of Mahatma Phule, Dr. Baba Sahib Ambedkar, through non-valid means, 
led the Dalits to agitate to open public places like temples and tanks to the aristocrats. He gave the famous slogan to the Dalits, Unite, Educate, Agitate. In his famous treatise, Adulation of Caste, Dr. Ambedkar wrote, There can't be a more degrading system of social organization than the caste system. It is the system that deadens, paralyzes, and cripples the people from helpful activity. Among Ambedkar's contemporaries in the anti-caste tradition in Maharashtra was Shahu Maharaj, who was the first in India to introduce the affirmative policy of reservation in education and jobs in his princely state of Kodak. Allaying the hegemonic caste structures and also gendered oppression. Yesterday, we had a very good discussion about Urmila Pawar's The Weave of My Life, so I will drop that part of my paper and pass on. The transformative potential of the two chosen texts have been represented by the role of memory to initiate a process of translation and recovery, bringing out a multi of a nation. It shows how Mahars and other Dalits themselves have perpetuated the caste system through asymmetry and the purification pollution principle among their own subcasts like the Mangs, Jamars, Matams, Bors, and others. I'm moving towards my conclusion. The translation transcends the gaps in sociological and geographical spaces and makes the spatial jumps to bring together different minds intellectually and emotionally from across the globe. There arises a need for introspection and self-analysis. The translator herself seems to carry the guilt of centuries on her sensitive, reflective mind. Gopal Guru feels that these translations have made the upwardly mobile Dalits uneasy. They feel embarrassed at the raw wounds which are laid bare to scrutiny, which they have even denied to acknowledge to themselves. The moral ethical questions which are raised because of the translations lead to many interrogations. It may also lead to a softening of the hardened and recalcitrant self. Well, thank you. And okay. I might uh, first be back to take questions and I'll open up. We have uh, a good uh, 10 minutes or so for any questions, please. Yes. As he likes does not have the academic sophistication, and it's not expected to be there. I take that point. But at the same time, I use a word that it is quite blunt, as opposed to the academic sophistication. So I was wondering, are you proposing some kind of sanitization process through which it has to undergo? It has to undergo that sanitization process in order to be uh, a kind of part of text. But it has to get that sort of sophistication. And the job of the translator or the editor is to get that sophistication, so to execute that process of sanitization. Is it that uh, Very kind of question that you're talking about? Or? Uh, yeah, this is the question I have been wondering for maybe uh, two and uh, one and a half decades. I'll, 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 sorry to yeah. interrupt you again. And I use the word sanitization in a very loaded sense. Yeah, yeah. this word. Yes. Uh, the first thing that I, sophistication, I didn't walk, use the word sophistication. I said uh, academic training. Academic training, there I refer to referencing, mainly the part of referencing. It's a discovery, it's some kind of, uh, uh, yeah, it was some kind of definitions also tribals go, but you know, the definitions that we don't include, tri uh, that it don't include tribals. So in India, the definition of Dalit, if you go back, there are several levels of definitions of Dalits. So, because you know, in yesterday without definitions, the Adibas is under Dalit also. But there are definitions which I don't think that uh, Dalits, uh, Adibashis are not within the Dalit category. Thank you to the presenters. But my question is for Sohar. Uh, you have presented a wonderful paper. And in the two leading Dalit autobiographies uh, in Maharashtra. 
And I just had a need of a bit of clarification regarding that very expression that uh, both of them in their own ways reclaim the history. Histories. So just for a minute if you could enlighten us. The history in Maharashtra of social reform which begins much before also even to the same poetry of the 12th century, 14th century. Then we come down to the 19th century which is called the Renaissance period. And of course, Dr. Baba Saheb Ambedkar and Shahu Maharaj. We have to remember his name in Maharashtra. Thank you. At the back. Yes, um, um, I just have a question a bit indirect in some ways. Um, what I want to know is that after the fact of several of languages being translated into English, what would be the effect for of the readership in the original language? And my, my question, I'm asking this question because many of us certainly who've been brought up in India have been brought up in a bilingual, trilingual yeah, policy. Exactly. So I can read Punjabi. So maybe a particular kind of writing, which was always available in Punjabi, wasn't even in my sphere of attention. It gets translated into English, and now I'm certainly made aware of something which I didn't know existed. Okay, there's a whole leadership, leadership in, the, in our state languages, which are already there, but many of us in the academia are not people who are who have that as a condition of English. So I want to know what is the effect of the translation going back to how many people read it? Has it helped to for people to read, go yeah. back to the monarchy or go back to Bengali or whatever it is that the, the original was written? Yeah. I'll share my own experience. I read the English versions first yeah. and then I went back to yes. the Marathi. Yeah. Because I find reading Marathi a bit, I speak Marathi, I converse, I write in Marathi, uh, I run the department of Hindi, Marathi, English. But in spite of that, I find reading Marathi difficult for myself. Especially the dialects which are used and the many practices which are mentioned in Urmila Pawar's book, those were also a little difficult for me to come up, to get across, to understand. So the English translation was easier for me as well. So reaching out through the English translation is to a wider audience, of course, the global audience is here in front of me. But even the intra-readers find it easier, to, to, if we are the academicians, yeah. we find it easier to go back to the native language. Yeah. So, so, my, so you're saying that, in, uh, my question particularly was, has it helped to increase the readership in the original language? I, do, I cannot vouch for that. But I was talking from my own personal experience. I have no statistics to say anything about. That would be interesting. That would be very interesting. To it's a good thing, but uh, I have. don't have the statistics there. That's good idea to look at. Okay, I, I just had a question yeah. for um, I recently translated um, and wrote on Murza uh, Heel um, uh, short story. And I had to use a 15 line poem from Imtiaz Dharkar and the publisher you know asked us to get copyright and I managed to do it yeah so it wasn't very difficult so why why was it hard for you I just wanted to know that yeah and Dharkar so I think some publishers are very difficult you know we tried also mm -hmm. and some died 30 years ago but, but uh, somebody will have problems. Yeah, but in the US we couldn't make it. Yeah. But we tried. We tried, but we couldn't make it then, so we had to cut it short. And you know, if the author is not dead for 70 years, you can't use. Who is a Dalit now? Am I a Dalit? So these questions, can we visualize them in the context of baby cow? I would like to ask you, <laughs> please. <laughs> Thank you. Let's get started so we can we can stay on time. I hardly need to introduce my abundance, and certainly not after the last paper, where we had a better introduction than, than I could ever give. Um, good 
even before that, I didn't have to because, of course, everybody knows who she is. But as is my role, I will do so. Anyway, um, I'm very honored today to introduce Maya Pundit. I had not had the opportunity to meet Maya until the occasion of this conference, but I have long been acquainted with her work, namely her important focus on Dalit women's life narratives through her translations of Baby Kambay's Gina Amcha as The Prisons We Broke in 2008 and Ormala Pawar's Aidan as The Weave of My Life, also in 2008. In both of these translations, critically important for their giving access to Dalit women's experiences and subjectivity, Maya also pays close attention to their innovative storytelling form. She writes of Baby Kambay's narrative that it is, quote, more of a sociobiography rather than an autobiography. It redefined the tradition of autobiographical writing in Marathi in terms of the form, the narrative strategies, the experimental world, and the selfhood and subjectivities involved. Maya has also translated other forms of literary writing from Dalit and non-Dalit writers, including Pule's Gulamgiri at Slavery in 2003, two plays by Jayant Pavar and Sanjay Pavar in 2013, and most recently Sanya's novel Tianantar as Thereafter last year. Her productivity and range as a literary translator is stunning in itself, but Maya also engages in intellectual and activist ways with contemporary social issues, writing extensively about such issues as teacher training in rural India and the gendered political debate over dancing girls in bars in Maharashtra. She's even made a documentary film, Voices from the Margins, on Marathi Dalit women writers. She's a professor at the English and Foreign Languages University in Hyderabad. Please join me in welcoming Maya. Thank you so much. I'll state we started in commentary. Uh, the title is Redrawing the Map of Cultural Politics. And why I'm calling that will be clear in the paper. Um, the terms Dalit and translation both pose problems of definition. The question of who constitutes the Dalit has been extensively debated, and this debate is predicated upon specific political questions. Is Dalit a term of reference for particular downtrodden castes, or does it refer to, and I quote, the depressed and suppressed groups of various social formations living more often than not on the margins of society. Unquote. Good. Can everybody living on the margins of society be called a Dalit? Zeliot claims that in the term and concept, Dalit itself there is an in inherent denial of dignity, a sense of pollution, and an acceptance of the karma theory that justifies the caste hierarchy, and she defines Dalit in a very specific sense that involves only the caste and religious dimensions of Dalit exploitation. For people who were the lowest in and outside of the social hierarchy that was spelled out by the Brahminical Chaturvarnya system. Whereas Vital Ramji Shinde used the term Bahujan to signal the majority that suffered discriminatory caste practices. Dar Shikov's 17th century translation of the Sanskrit Upanishadas uh, into Persian crossed over into West Asia. The plethora of terms in Marathi for translation marking different functions such as Anuvad, which means following, Bhashantar, crossing over to another language, Rupantar, changing form, Charya, means shadow, shadow of the original, Tika, interpretation of Kriti, Tarzuma or Bhavartha, summary, uh, represent philosophical concerns about translations and there have been approaches to language which consider the very act of speaking as translation. For instance, we have a fourfold category, categorization of in Sanskrit uh, poetics about language, para, pashanti, uh, madhyama and vaikhari. Para is something there in the brain and then pashanti is you see it and madhyama is you carry it forward from the semantics of inside somewhere in the lexicon, bring it to the level of the word author itself would beg questions in Marathi if it could be translated at all. The idea of the original represented the empire where the translations were the exotic colonies which had to be modeled on the original, pressed faithfully into its service without any concern for their own knowledge systems and the conflicts and contradictions therein. The 19th century was a period during which both movement and translation were being recast into colonial and patriarchal molds and discursively produced and disseminated through various discourses. So, um, my interpretation of Bevita's engagement then differed from the received notions of what translator should be as a faithful uh, recorder, you know, I refuse. I did not want to bring it anywhere close to the sense of self-pity that the original title signified, but bring out the agency and the grit of the Dalit woman because it was there in the text, it was not in 
added to it. It was there in the text. And it was important for me to foreground it than just focus on the pain and suffering because it was my movement as well. Let me speak about the translation of Dalit writing, which has been a form of resistance to oppressive domination of unjust, two unjust hegemonic traditions, structures and values, values of Hinduism and the regional languages. It evokes cultural memory to open up the genealogies of oppression and also of resistance to that oppression, mostly endorsing the domination of the Hindu upper caste male constructions, either similar to their European counterparts or familiar to them through the Orientalist traditions. Translating the literature means subverting these regional traditions and redefining the boundaries of Indian literature in English. Though the British kept intact and further entrenched the caste system. Their agrarian policies like land reforms, land ownership, taxes brought into existence a new world in which diverse traditional communities were not only deprived of their rights but branded as the other, as the criminals in their own land by the Criminal Rights Act. Take for instance, a famous sociological account like Atres Gaugada, which is a famous uh, sociology textbook, which was an insider's narrative of the intricacies of the village structure, tasks, and the functional roles. <coughs> this delegitimized subject has a long tradition of speaking out and talking back, both in the oral tradition formed by folk forms like Tamasha, Gundar, tales, songs, composition of same poets, written traditions constituted by subversive writings like Mahatma Phule, Muktabai Sal Salve. Tarabai Shinde, so on and so forth, Shahu Maharaj Ambedkar, so on and so forth. The speaking voice in this self-narrative is the eye of the deauthorized, delegitimized and marked body that articulates a challenge from the domain of alterity and signifies an agency that initially obliterates the distance between the self and the community. But gradually, it emerges as a voice of an individual gendered subject making sense of the changing relationship between patriarchy, caste system, caste, class and modernity. From a collective unified self, one progresses to a modern fractured self. So the tradition of Marathi women's writings gets significantly altered, but how does one get this alterity and alteration in the traditional translated texts? It's significant to note that Urmila was criticized for her frankness, not only by the adher adherents to the traditional patriarchal ideologies, but also by stalwarts in the Dalit movement. Post-colonial studies has absolutely ignored this theatre in general and Dalit theatre in particular. Now, drama as a cultural form of uh, as a form of cultural production is distinctively different from other forms. Uh, for instance, uh, there are certain set features and all all of these other novel or um, short story or lyric. They have to be read in the private spaces, but uh, the language of uh, the, the theatre is a, a, a play, uh, dramatic text, uh, is not to be read in the confines of one's own personal space unless you are translating it as a closet play. The, um, it is located in the discourse of performative arts which generally is intensely culture specific. The language of a given text is shaped and embedded in cultural conventions, canons, traditions of these arts, like lighting, costume, dialogue delivery, so on and so forth. There is a huge performance, a uh, gestic dimension, to use Susan Bassett's term, that can be only realized only in performance. It is not merely deeply embedded in the text. It is a defining structural element of the language. It realizes itself through performance, and if you don't know this, then you your translation is bonkers. Involves an awareness of multiple signs and codes at several levels of performative systems. Now, the problem is uh, there is no fixed set or uh, nor does the original have a fixed identity, and you cannot be uh, you cannot be certain about how is it actually going to be done. Uh, but as has been proved by so many Shakespeare translations, the original text depends more on the translation to use Benjamin's term. Um, translation doesn't remain here at all a secondary process, it's a primary one. Uh, now, the asymmetrical relationship between the source culture and the target culture acquires a special significance and difficulty for another reason. The translation actually lies in limbo, in an in-between space, neither Marathi nor English which would be very difficult to visualize for a performative text. You know? 
Now there have been apprehensions about translating Dalit writing into English as being absorbed into the totalitarian regimes of English or publishers attraction to the lit writing as a profitable saleable commodity. Engaged publishers such as Mini or Mandira would protest against such a view as for them anti-caste protest literature is distinguished both by an experienced majority people don't share and a use of speech styles that have been long considered unacceptable. For them, this publishing the lit writing is sensitizing the market and some of some sort of a social responsibility. Maybe all publishers may not be like that, but all publishers are not bad also. It is very important to produce knowledge in English from and in local languages. Especially significant are issues of identity, language, knowledge construction, and its relationship with power, as well as the creation of new traditions in the dark, in-between spaces between the source text and the target. Dalit translations would help us challenge institutional authorities empower the underprivileged and form bridges with similar communities across the world. Then only translation would be a border crossing in the true sense of the term. The diversification and hybridization can help us challenge the dominant unifying tendencies in the global culture. Since the local is systematically denied any epistemological possibility of its own knowledge, Dalit translation would show us one way of establishing the local into the dominant discourse of the global. Thank you. What I did was, I tried to place, because when you read the text in Marathi, there is a lot of knowledge at the back of your mind, which you want drawing on. Now, if a person from Kannada, or if a person from Nepali uh, region is trying to read and understand what it means, I will be very unfair to the reader. So, I need to make this translation a thick translation, by which I mean it has to be substantiated, strengthened by giving introductions, four words, uh, interviews, uh, long notes, glossary of course, so on and so forth. So it's not just a padding because these are the integral cultural histories, the slices of history, at least some of which if presented to the reader, probably will make him help, uh, be a help for him to understand the text better. Place it in the context, that is what I mean. But you know what I'm trying to tell you is that there is a whole history of subjugation at different levels and especially women's writing. Which is what, I don't know, maybe if you think what I've done is not right, fine. No, that's no, no, that's not what you're saying. No, I understand. It's a question about it. Hi, um, you were comparing the role of the translator in both the two male female. Um, and I found that um, the, to, to compare that role when actually the translator is in a position of power, um, in terms of caste seemed odd to me because you're, you're saying that the, the translator is a, you're using the word submissive and um, is in, in the role of a female in relationship to the author. But actually the actual power relationship between the author and writer in this context is very different. So I wanted to ask about that. And I guess connected to that also is um, relating to Kalyan's paper yesterday and um, the role of interrogating your own caste in the process of translating and how that is it a process so that in which you grow and question and you know you you're, you face and confront your own um, you know caste caste background absolutely I mean there are passages when I was translating and I would just sit down you know with the weight of the whole world in my head absolutely feeling crushed but what, what cultural history do I inherit? You actually said that you felt choked. I did. And I used to cry buckets. I'm a person who generally never sheds tears, you know. But uh, being, in, being a part of the women's movement taught me, uh, you know, egalitarian practices uh, and how we were all together there, one. But when I interacted with the text, there was no pride as a translator, there was no power relationship. If at all there was, there was a terrible sense of guilt, at least, when I translated baby. You know, and baby had to literally take me into her arms and pat me and say, it's okay, it's okay, <laughs> you know. So, uh, no, no, it wasn't like that at all. Like, you know, there's a, I don't know how to express this, but working within the women's movement opened me up so many possibilities of making friendships with men and women on a very different footing. 
and when I am talking about the translator being perceived as such in the traditional discourse, I was trying to place myself, myself into that traditional role and saying I don't belong there. I am an autonomous being as a writer, as a translator. I am no subservient person. Though I have all these casts, I am not just talking about myself, talking about all the translators because they generally, you know, also ran kind of a treatment that we always... In Marathi we say, Neeto Bharavahi Hamala. You know, I am... <laughs> I am this is a very famous sentence from one of the same poets, Tukara, who says that, you know, I am nothing else, but I am a pulley carrying your luggage. So that is how translators have been described in Marathi. And I was saying, no, it's not just that. I am doing something different. He's my comrade. He's my comrade in arms. And this is my beholder duty to spread her word across. You see, it's a very complicated affair, I suppose. But it certainly never had a sense of me being superior to her. It's not a question of superiority. It's a question of sharing words. It's a question of sharing duties and responsibilities. Love and affection. I don't know whether that sounds good in an academic discourse. But that well, I think that is, uh, people mm -hmm. does talk about the erotic <coughs> kind of intimate relationship. Uh, which is was not body. erotic. Yes, but very intimate kind of relationship. Yes, and and, yeah. and a relationship of equality, not as somebody who is yeah. behind. You know, we always forget the class angle. So, how do you see as being like you know high class also? Uh, does that figure into your translation practice? You know, it's it's like that. Or I was younger sister to baby. I mean, that kind of a sisterhood that I'm talking about. In spite of the differences between the caste and the class yeah. locations. We are just uh, interested in knowing because we are always shy away from talking about the class angle and uh, about the political angle of the uh, translations of the texts that we are dealing with. You know, so I was wondering why you have also. It's a, not it's a concept the, of sharing cultural capital. If I share my cultural capital of the knowledge of language, I would like to share Urmila's cultural capital of cooking different kinds of fish in the chula. Or it's all the same for me in a sense, you know. So having to, like as, as uh, uh, Marissa you talks about how, or, or even uh, uh, in Jutan we read about eating the rotis taken from uh, the high class people's houses and then saving it for later use, that, that's class. You know, that's no, not just culture, just make that's that point class. Point. Do you believe that caste is something which cannot be broken? Then you are not a follower of Ambedkar who wrote, writes about annihilation of caste. Then I am not a follower of so Fule. Class in terms of class also. No, no. A class becomes very important. But I don't think that class also is a category which cannot you cannot break. But you can. You that's what I am asking. Like how do you yes. break that? That's what I am asking. How do you break that? You have to live with me and find out. I can't describe it. <laughs> <laughs> I say it also all the time as a translator. No, related to yeah. this, I have a question about the title. Can I ask? Ask, ask. Ask, ask. Maya, related to this, I want to ask a question about the title. Yeah. I personally didn't, I don't agree that the title should have been changed to the prisons we broke. Mm -hmm. I feel here it may not be caste, class or anything, but your uh, maybe your move, women's uh, movement and political background that's intervening as a translator. Mm -hmm. The original title, Jina Amche, Our Life, could have been like our kind of life. Because basically, in this finish, mm -hmm. the whole autobiography has lots of aspects about their lives. It's about, you know, how a woman delivers a baby and the whole process that happens, what is given to eat and all. It's about marriages, a lot of details about the marriages. And in that, they are also resisting. And by giving it the title, The Prisons We Broke, your political and, you know, some intervention is happening. Yeah. Sure. No, it's not your yeah, yeah, translation. Yeah. Yeah. I finished, yeah. No. Uh, I am going by uh, on this point. Uh, they knew in uh, Delhi University, there was discussion about our uh, title, Devita is Kamlesh and my title. Uh, why prison? We are not uh, prisoner. Means we are not uh, did any uh, accused. So why there is prison? Okay, this uh, kind of for babies. And my this is a, uh, um, the view of my life. Why not our life? Means uh, I am the part of our society, not only it is my life. I know. Mm -hmm. So uh, in Mumbai University, Ramesh Kamre and Abhinaya Kamre, 
Um, and I'm going to look at what that means in terms of the meaning of that. Uh, more specifically, I'm going to look at the shifts in the intended audiences that happens between the original Hindi and its translation, um, doing kind of what Kalyan proposed, looking at um, in translator's notes and, um, and writer's notes. The, the word mainstreaming, because I was like, what does it even mean? So I... <laughs> My solution was to, to open the uh, Oxford English Dictionary and see what is the, the um, definition given. And it, mean, it gives the ideas, attitudes, or activities that are shared by most people and regarded as normal or conventional. Uh, but this can be interpreted, in, I guess, in different ways. And for, the translation of the Dalit texts into English comes as a result of the imperative as part of yeah, to, the imperative to have Dalit voices heard by a wider audience, um, which is some of you have uh, talked about it yesterday and today. Uh, but who is that audience that is a euphemistically referred to as the wider audience? In the case of Hindi Dalit literature, it's Dalits from other language backgrounds, English-speaking Savarnas, and sympathetic foreigners, most often than not academics, as I understand, but it might be wrong. Um, we, the people working in a profession dealing with language, know that translation is not a straightforward process, uh, but, but usually the, our unpacking of translation stops at the work of the translator, and this is where I would like to begin, because I think it, it does, the translator is not the only person engaged in the process. Um, the, as the text travels through the hands of different actors, from the writer to the translator, and from tra translator to the academic, the order is reversible here. The division of readership is even further exacerbated in the English translations, because of the linguistic difference. Um, and there are, and this kind, of, this double audience has to be dealt with, not only by the translator but also by the publisher, as in where where to pitch your book. Uh, one of the ways in which publishers and translators deal with the problem of double audience in Dalit literature is including as much material as needed to aid the reading of those not considered to naturally understand Dalit life words, which is also a lot uh, what you've talked about. Um, as Anup Mukherjee was mentioning yesterday, this ch the additional material changes the book, and um, and I'm I'm going to look at how the meaning may change. I also see the, but I also see the burgeoning field of Dalit criticism by Dalit subordinates and foreign. Um, academics grouped together here for the purpose of this paper, but of course there's. And from this, I can see how the shift of, how there's a shift in the, um, in the audience that the, the English tra translation was. Um, and the whole book also in, in, it, in the way it was produ produced shapes itself more on the translation from different Indian languages to English published by Penguin India. Uh, this is also something that Anand says. He asks, do Savarna writers attach their caste name to their writing? Many of the reviewers who so eagerly highlighted the unflinching social consciousness and stylistic originality of Ajay's text could have, I surmised, much more easily than I, who does so only with a well-thumbed Hindi dictionary at my side, walked into any Hindi bookshop in the capital and picked up one of Ajay's three published books, albeit ones who do not themselves choose to read in Hindi. The question that arises then is what is the role of translation to English specifically? Is what the role of translation to English specifically plays in mediating between these hierarchical spheres of language and literary expression? How ironically does a conscious non-reading of literary production in one language, that is Hindi, by another linguistic class, English, and I use the term class very specifically, as one's preference and or ability to read in English or Hindi is very much socioeconomically determined. How does this, this conscious non-reading engender a culture of translation? 
Or to flip the question around, does a culture of translating in fact encourage non-reading across language divides? What are the consequences when a text requires mediation by a translator or an academic before it is deemed worthy of attention, critical engagement, or praise? Indeed, when it is deemed worthy of reading at all. That brings me to the second case for consideration here. In her lengthy introduction to Namayana's recent edition of Annihilation of Caste, Arundhati Roy note, notes that when she first read Ambedkar, she felt as, quote, as if someone had walked into a dim room and opened all the windows. Roy claims that she had never had occasion to read Ambedkar until Anand, from Navayana, handed her a copy of Annihilation of Caste. That is, as she writes in the introduction, Ambedkar's work, quote, unlike the writings of Gandhi, Nehru, or Vivekananda, does not shine out at you from the shelves of libraries and bookshops. But it is this non-reading and the attempts of Roy and Anand to bring the text to new, perhaps willfully ignorant audiences of readers, um, an audience of the an audience of the privileged castes, as well as an international one, that has run them afoul of some very vocal Dalit critics and activists. But interlingual translation, or translation proper, is also part of the text's story, as well as the controversy swirling around it. Anand does provide, in the notes, translations of Sanskrit shlokas from the Manusmriti and other classical texts, and in Becker quotes, but these untranslated in the original. Additionally, the explosion of ire on social media from Dalit activists and critics seems, seem to have been sparked by a case of mistranslation. Roy's introductory essay titled The Doctor and the Saint, referring Roy asserts ironically to Gandhi's status as Mahatma and unironically to Ambedkar's academic achievements, was rendered in Telugu in a local newspaper before, before a scheduled and then later canceled book launch in Hyderabad in vocabulary that rendered its meaning as the medical doctor and the prophet. What this fateful mistranslation conveyed in disabling Roy's irony was that Roy's essay diminished and better and valorized Gandhi. The key question is, the key question then is which authorities are legitimate? Who embodies the power to declare that something written can be read as literature? And how, perhaps, can we begin to dilute and expand that power? Pankaj Mishra is an internationally renowned author who regularly publishes in The Guardian, one of the most visible media publications on the planet. Remaining vigilant that the work we do enables, rather than disables, the power of Dalit writing to speak its own voice. As Praveena Thali, another contributor to Roundtable India, decries what she refers to as Roy's messiah consciousness, though Dalits are perfectly capable of articulating their subjectivity. Uh, okay, we've got two to begin with, Kavita and then Yuvia. And uh, three. Sorry, three. Kavita. Um, I'm George of Faith and Laura, and I like the fact that you're Placing yourself in um, the role that you play as translator. Um, when you're talking about the Arunathi Roy in the introduction, I think I was intrigued by this use of the word, uh, you said the explosion of ire. And I think it just to me seemed to connect to the kind of, so you didn't talk about the response to the criticism, which I think was very significant because actually yeah. you mean the, kind of, the kind of casteism that came up in the response to these very valid critiques was very revealing, including Rundit Roy herself calling them frothing hyenas, or social media that its people are saying, even though in her introduction she says that you know, they don't have the space in the main, mainstream media to so to use that as a form of dismissing the vote of the room. And so many people who, you know, are seen as very progressive, the kind of things that they were saying, talking about freedom of expression and identity politics as something, you know, this is just identity politics and we all can write about everything, anything. I mean I could just give you so many quotes you know, yeah. that yeah. I've seen on Facebook and kind of sorry I won't go on. But um, I think that's the uh, an important thing, and then also the fact that the role of the translator, when that translator becomes more prominent, then what, the, who are they translating, which is what happened in the case of um, Arunda Roy, that you're actually... Okay, can I stop you there, Karita? Um, yeah, um, it's a comment or a question, please. Can you say it's a comment or a question, because you have to give the speakers a chance to respond. And we should go to and meet, uh, to that uh, the book launch, mm -hmm. and talk about, like, Debate with her. Yes, uh, uh, this session uh, is on translation and retranslation. Uh, 
I would uh, call it the future of translation, uh, the word retranslation, because uh, that is, uh, you know, the uh, the area which actually uh, is to uh, take the writing, its culture and its uh, 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 content uh, through various uh, languages, uh, translations, uh, in a way, uh, rewritings, and so on and so forth. So the uh, idea of the origin, originality or authenticity, which sounds uh, uh, quite uh, limited and very theoretical uh, uh, and uh, uh, so human uh, beings as homo sapiens actually are storytellers. They are by birth storytellers. And uh, so translation and retranslation is actually an act of the storytelling and living in a world where we create narratives. And the debate and the discourse goes on about what is authentic and what is not authentic. But it is also a fact that authenticity of being a human is also always in question. So I think human himself is a translate, translated being and always requires retranslation. So that is my uh, take on this, uh, 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 this, this session. We have uh, three uh, speakers, uh, Rowena Hill, uh, Stephanie Kreiner. I would uh, uh, thank Nanda, uh, who is from Switzerland and knows German, and this chair man, no person, uh, this chair person is, you know, a very much limited to uh, uh, German language, though his daughter is doing PhD in German studies. But uh, uh, I took help and uh, uh, understood most of the terms and words that are in German. I will try to uh, pronounce them, them correctly. If still there is mistake, that would be, uh, uh, I would like uh, to um, uh, uh, apologize for that, because uh, uh, in language, a sound uh, can matter a lot culturally. So that's uh, important. Now, we have three uh, papers here. And uh, 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 we have uh, speakers, uh, Mudan Kuru Jina Swami, who is a poet. He's uh, talking about translation of Dalit literature. Then Rowena Hill, who is independent scholar and translator. And uh, speaking about, uh, right, has a paper on translating uh, Modnakudu Chira Swami Dalit point in Kannada. So uh, you can see the uh, proximity. Then Stephanie Kreiner uh, is uh, 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 reading a paper, The Mystery of the German Silver Cattle, translating Harish Manglam's short stories into uh, German. And uh, <coughs> Uh, Rowena Hill, uh, I introduce, uh, was born in England in 1938 and went to school in New Zealand. So this is also, I think, uh, an act of translation, retranslation. Uh, born if in I may interrupt, I'm not a totally independent scholar. I'm going okay. to okay. an Asian and African study group of a university okay. in Venezuela. <coughs> okay. And I've spent most of my life actually in Venezuela. Right, 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 I'm, I'm just using this brochure. Uh, yeah. uh, so, <clears throat> uh, thank you for uh, adding this information. It's quite important for all of us. And uh, she taught English literature at the University of the Laos and is in Merida, Venezuela, where she has lived for 40 years. She has published six books of poems in Spanish as well as poems, essays, and translations in periodicals in Venezuela, Colombia, India, and USA, and lately on the internet. 
She has recently translated into English some of Venezuela's best known poets. Her translations from Kannada include Naming the Nameless, metaphysical poems from ancient Kannada, Masur 1983, and the Spanish version uh, I pronounce based on my phonetic knowledge of English, Nombres de lo Inome Brale Caracas. So you can understand what does that mean. 1993. Mm -hmm. And then Poemas de uh, Mudnakudus China Swami, uh, selected poems of the Dalit poet uh, in Spanish. And uh, that is uh, in uh, Venezuela, Venezuelan Ministry of Culture 2005. And so uh, this is an uh, introduction of one of the speakers. And uh, other speaker is uh, Stephanie Kreiner, is a research assistant at the Department of Anglophone Literatures and Literary Translation at Heinrich Heine University, uh, Dusseldorf. She holds a BA in English and Communication and Media Studies as well as uh, MA in Literary Translation for Language, English, Spanish and German. Both degrees have been awarded by Heinrich Heine Dusseldorf. Uh, during her studies, she spent a semester at Angelia Ruskin University in Cambridge. In cooperation with the Austrian Pen Club, she has edited uh, <coughs> Aus dem Swiss List, Fiat uh, Sein Einblind das Leben von uh, Unpehu Born. Uh, I think we're ready. Yeah, I okay. think we're ready to So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, just brief, uh, you know, because I'm also going to be very brief here. Because <laughs> this, uh, <laughs> this, this, this uh, session uh, is very unique in the history of conferences, <laughs> we have plurality of chairmanship. So after I finish this introduction, another chairperson will arrive here. Okay. So We're going I... to do the dirty job. No, no, not the dirty job. <laughs> and keep the time. <laughs> no, no, no. no. <laughs> yeah. So uh, uh, this is uh, uh, then the German translation of an anthology of short stories by Dalit author Harish Mangalam. She has translated... You, you don't need to have no, no, we'll, we'll, I'm going to talk about it anyway. So. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you so much. And that's a uh, uh, great help to me. And uh, now I uh, invite Judith to take over okay. this task. I will. Thank, Thank you very much. We're all ready to start. Yeah. Yeah. Good afternoon. Uh, I have not prepared a long speech. As a poet, I would like to read some poetry later after uh, Ruina finishes her job. Anyway, I have in the brief, I tell my own story and read a poem. The title of this paper is In Search for the Light Without Shadow. I am greatly indebted to the authorities of HRC and the University of East Anglia for the invitation to this conference as a speaker. I am asked to speak about my work and my experience in getting my poems translated. To begin with about my work, I would say it was an arduous journey. I had no formal preparation to become a writer, nor had I dreamt about it. But it just happened. I am the first generation graduate, but for the stigma of untouchability, but for the pain of inequality stemmed out of the caste system, and but for the insult and injury associated with that, I think I wouldn't have been a writer. In a biased society with caste prejudices, one can imagine the hurdles a Dalit who is at the lowest rung has to pass through to make his voice heard. Therefore, a Dalit writer needs to be four times more competent 
to get the lime, get to the limelight and attract the attention of the media, critics and other opinion makers who are still from the dominant upper caste. They mostly go unnoticed or taken with a pinch of salt, even to this day. Now, let me come to the second part. The language used till then in Kannada Dalit poetry was boisterous, violent, with anger and fury, which was not palatable to me. I tried to vent my feelings in a different texture altogether. I honed my language. I wanted it to be as poignant as possible, as vibrant as possible. That's the reason academia received my poetry with awe and inspiration. First of all, the word untouchability is not translatable. It's not found either in the dictionary. It is implied with the red underline in the computer. The severity of the pain of untouchability is not as much understood in India. The, the untouchables, themselves being sullied over, over a period of time, get habituated and keep whining with social disability. The conservative caste people, within quotes, Savarnas as they are called, still believe that the untouchables are lesser mortals, born out of sins committed in their previous birth, and hence the sense of equality and respect for others in Hindu society is nullified by the belief in itself. The outsiders will understand the real horror of untouchability and sympathize. This came to my knowledge when I visited the University of Andes, Merida in Venezuela on the invitation from the Asian and African diaspora. Those students and teachers were flabbergasted on hearing about the practice of untouchability. They would flock around me and gently touch my skin as if they flowed the electric current. Some, someone would come and ask me, can I touch you? What a morbid and sinister practice it could be. Most of them, my works in the background necessarily have these pains and the sense of being unequal. My poems have been translated into English, Spanish, Hebrew, Hindi, Urdu, and a few other vernaculars in India, but anthologies have been published in Hindi, Urdu, and Spanish. I had already translated, in collaboration with experts on the subject, a collection of vachanas, the poems of the metaphysical and social movement in Karnataka in the 10th to 12th centuries, and a number of works by poets of the renewal of Kannada literature that occurred from the middle of the 20th century onward. We evolved a method of translating. I have always been, and I still am, ashamed of my inability to learn to speak Canada. I speak several European languages, and I used to think of myself as something of a linguist, but Canada defeated me. <laughs> Maybe I was too old to absorb a language so different from any I knew. In my own defense, I have to say that I tried, and I took lessons in India with several teachers, none of whom had any idea, apparently, how to teach a foreigner. <laughs> in Venezuela, where I lived, there was no one who could help me with Canada, and nothing like a language laboratory. I studied the grammar by myself. I like grammar, and Canada grammar is quite simple and logical but that didn't seem to help me to follow and use the spoken language. However, it did help me to work out the patterns and structures in any poem I dealt with. Of course, I had also learned to read the script. When we started our work together, Chinnaswamy's English was quite limited, though already adequate, with the help of gestures and a dictionary, for the kind of discussions we had around his text. <laughs> His language, fortunately for me, apart from some particular terms, is common Canada, to call it something. So we didn't have the complication of dialect, as happens with some Dalit writers. As time went on, his English improved and grew rapidly, and the dictionary could be set aside. <laughs> At all stages, our attention was focused on the words, the matter of the poem, and all through these discussions that have been going on here, I keep thinking, well, writing, especially poetry, is words. You can deal with words. You can do something with a word, usually. 
There's quite a lot of moving to be done to turn Canada into a European language, since its structures tend to be back to front as compared to, to ours. I could see how each word related to each, and I'd been given all the meanings. I could hear the assonances and the repetitions of sounds, largely from verbal suffixes. It was then up to me to turn it into acceptable English, if possible, keeping something of the quality of its language. I should perhaps state briefly that my conception of the function of the translator of poetry is to keep as close to the original as is compatible with producing a text readable as a poem, or at least as an object to be appreciated. I think the Spanish translations are probably more satisfactory than the English, since in Spanish, word order is more flexible, and there are more repetitions of sounds and parts of speech that could, to some extent, match the repetitions in Canada. The rhythm of Spanish is also more musical, with longer cadences. The last trans of this poem, Nanandu Marava Gindare. Yari Yagutu, Nanna Ante Kaladali, Kadidu Tunda the Vanasirundu, Homagni Libendu, Pavanavagutti Teno, Atava, Satpurshan of Banahena Kechetavagi, Nalpujana Sajara, Hegale Rabudite. And the English, who knows at the end, hacked into pieces of dry wood, burning in the holy fire, I might be made pure, or becoming the beer for a sinless body, be borne on the shoulders of four good men. I'm only talking about the sound here. I don't know if it's possible at all to appreciate what I was saying, but in fact the Spanish, to me at least, is better as an echo of the Canada. Which, since they are made up of concrete terms, can usually be reconstituted directly in the target language. That they may have different cultural associations is not something the translator can be responsible for, unless they could lead to serious misunderstanding. Here and there, one's pretty broken dolls may kindle a light in his mind, finding marble skin pushing into playfulness. Broken eggshells may cut his feet, he may thrust his hand into the pocket of old shorts and touch a blunt blade and the gush of spurting blood will further squeeze his sapless frame. This of course means that the strength of a translation will also reside in the images, in the exactness of descriptive words rather than those for emotions. There are other Kannada Dalit writers such as Siddhimingaya in whose work the anger and the hate for oppressors is much more outspoken and the right terms to express these feelings become more important. A selection of my translations into Spanish was my introduction. Akitrave is considered by some the best poetry journal being published in Colombia at present and appears both in a print edition and online and the reaction to the poems was enthusiastic. So before the Mali festival, the place is ominous. Grandma becomes anxious, she may be blamed for something bad happening. Her food comes punctually, her plate of greens taunts her. Her spoiled daughter-in-law gets angry and calls her names. <coughs> when she's not in the corner, she's staggering on her stick to the backyard, or from the yard to the corner. Her end should come there in the corner, Grandma thinks as she sits brooding. In the yard, people may balk at lifting her. And not on the dark stretch between either, people on the road would feel sorry for her. Always in her trance, the grandmother thinks how many relatives will come as crows to the ashes she leaves. Um, the paper I'm about to present to you is derived from experience and gathered in the course of a tra translation project at Heinrich Heine University, Düsseldorf, in cooperation with the Austrian Pen Club. During the academic year of 2013-2014, 14 short stories by, by Dalit author Harish Mangala from Gujarat were translated into German by students of the master degree course in literary translation under my supervision. 
Originally, the short stories were written in Gujarati. However, the translation into German is based on the English translation of those short stories by Rupani Berg. Um, in our opinion, the cause of promoting Dalit literature outweighed the fact that none of the translators is able to speak Gujarati. Uh, we are all quite new to the subject, and I would still not consider myself an expert in Dalit literature. Therefore, the author was invited to Düsseldorf after the finalization of the first drafts of the translations so that we could peruse them, the translations and revise them in close collaboration with the author. The translations were published in the Edison Pen, which promotes human rights literature. Um, I will briefly outline the state of Dalit literature in German-speaking countries, that is Austria, Switzerland and Germany, before outlining only a few of the translation difficulties we encountered and the strategies we developed in dealing with them against the backdrop of a couple of admittedly Western translation theories. The general German-speaking readership cannot be expected to know much about Dalit issues, let alone Dalit literature. Even though Austrian, German and Swiss people have heard of the caste system, it would be difficult for most of them to name just one caste. Um, furthermore, the term Dalit is generally only used in academic circles among Indologists. The general German-speaking public still uses the term Unberührbare, that is, untouchables. Only few know about the history of the Dalits, their struggle for emancipation or their current situation. The major aim of our translation project was to raise awareness of Dalit issues in, German -speaking, in the German-speaking audience and introduce it to Dalit literature. The anthology is therefore a commitment with a purpose, as um, Jaideep Sarangi put it today. Um, it is not a commercial but an idealistic and educational project. Many mainstream publishers shy away from footnotes and other explanatory material for translations or contemporary fiction in Germany and other German-speaking countries. Our publisher, however, did not give us such restrictions. To the contrary, my co-editor, Dr. Helmut Niederle, the president of the Austrian Pen Club, encouraged us to use any technique we could think of in order to give the readers the information needed to understand the different levels of meaning of Harish Mangalam's short stories. Our implied target audience was interested in human rights issues, but due to the rather limited corpus of Indian literature available in German, we assumed a high level of unfamiliarity with Indian culture and Dalit issues amongst our probable readership of the foreign text to target language cultural values. Why, end of quote, why the foreignizing method is described as ethno-deviant pressure on those values to register the linguistic and cultural differences of the foreign text. So according to Venuti, the foreignizing method acknowledges cultural differences between source and target text. Schleiermacher claims that translators have to decide between the two methods he develops. He argues that the methods are so different from each other that reader and writer would not meet at all if the translation methods were mixed. The footnotes goes on to tell about English loan words in the Gujarati language and their corruption according to Gujarati pronunciation. As Germans, we asked ourselves what a German silver cattle could be. What would be German about it? Would it have a specific design or is German qualified for silver? Is it Silver from Germany, or maybe a synonym for another metal like steel? <laughs> and why do we as Germans not know what a, what a German silver kettle is supposed to be? <laughs> In order to decide how to translate this noun phrase, the translators had to find out what it refers to and what aspects of the tea kettle is being foregrounded. This information was not provided by the footnote in the English translation and our research did not yield any definite results. Of course, it would have been possible to simplify matters by translating the Java silver kettle simply as a kettle. Another alternative, the translation Deutscher Silberkessel, German silver kettle, would have pro prompted the same questions for the readers that I've just illustrated. Eventually, we had to ask the author. Um, <laughs> And he told us that jar of silver is, a, is aluminium. <laughs> Arish Mandalam uses the kettle to illustrate the social strata of the characters in his story. The jar of silver kettle is the cheapest kettle they can buy. Translating jar of silver as German silver would therefore not achieve our status of <laughs> Dalit and Gujarati culture to our readership because it would confuse readers. <laughs> and draw their attention away from socio-economic and towards linguistic aspects if we stuck with a similar footnote 
as the English translation. Since Gujarati pronunciation of English loan words is not addressed in any other of Harish Mangalam's short stories, and since he did not find this aspect of the Gujarati language particularly noteworthy in the course of the workshop, we decided to omit this level of the meaning in favor of stressing the social implications, which are often bound to specific realia in Harish Mangalam's stories. For example, a family in Vortex, Kundalu Virbu, uses a rather shapeless mortar because they did not buy it but made it from stone they found by the river. Um, there, are only, there are only few realia described at all in, in these short stories and they always indicate that people don't have money to buy better, um, better things. Um, in the end we decided to translate the drama Silver Kettle as Verbeulte Aluminium Kanne, <laughs> as Battered Aluminium Kettle. The adjective for boiled, battered, has been added to emphasize its condition and the fact that it has been well used and is not made from sturdy but from cheap material. As you can see, we used a strategy that can be described as domesticating translation in this case. We decided to imply the socio-economic <coughs> level of meaning and omitted the implications of language contact in favor of a more fluent reading experience. As the Scopus theory shows, Translation is an act with a certain purpose that depends and is defined by, this, by the situation in which it takes place. In the case of this anthology, the author took part in the translational act. He helped to discern the importance of idiosyncratic reality of the rural Gujarat, like the jar and the silver cattle, for the understanding of the respective short stories. The entire project would not be possible without English as a lingua franca. German, Austrian and Swiss publishers are very reluctant when it comes to translations from Indian vernacular languages. Moreover, there are very few translators that speak Gujarati and German. If there are any, I have never met. <laughs> so the retranslation of the English translation was our only option. What is more, English served as the lingua franca while we discussed the short stories with the author and negotiated certain meanings. Based on this, the translators were able to develop a translation strategy consisting of domesticating as well as foreignizing methods in order to achieve the scopus of raising awareness of Dalit issues in a rather uninformed German-speaking audience. It's my last paragraph, actually. The Austrian, the Austrian pen club and I are planning to continue this project with a new anthology of Dalit short stories and I would thankfully consider suggestions from you. <laughs> this is why I'm going to give you my email address if you don't have it yet. Uh, please let me know if you can think of any short stories. And I'm interested in short stories um, because I think translating poetry would be a, a stretch for, for our students. Um, because some of them are only in the first year. So. Um, and we want to provide as many students as possible with projects. So short stories would be better than novels. <laughs> um, so if you think, can think of any works that readers in Austria, Germany and Switzerland might be interested in, I'd be happy to, to receive your suggestions. I'm also very glad that I have met so many expert, experts on Dalit literature in the aftermath of the publication of Aus dem Zwielicht. For example, in the course of this uh, conference, but also in the course of others. Hopefully, they will be part of the Translational Act for our next publication. And with this, I'm going to thank you and show you a picture of the chat. <laughs> <laughs> Translation as being um, a room where you can actually move the furniture around, and it seems to be, um, you know, it seems to be such a perfect image for the, the unique combination of elements that are contained in the translation. That is constraint, intimacy, and freedom. So, um, yeah. and I, I'm sure you have plenty of questions uh, as well pertaining to the to all the papers. Um, floor is yours. Yes. I have a very simple question for the summit. You were reading out the English version of your poem. How does it feel to read out the translated work? So, because I, I have involved in translation myself, so I feel the same 
You feel the yeah. same while reading it. Yeah, I yeah. feel it's my own. <laughs> okay. In collaboration is at work. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, Perfect. Yeah. And uh, they have been appreciated uh, you know, very much. Mm -hmm. uh, two small observations for Stephanie. Yeah. Uh, one, uh, very interestingly, that you when you said, talked about the word charpai, cord. So you were actually translating the English back into the native language and <laughs> deciding what to do with it, you know. So ah, that's okay. interesting. <laughs> and secondly, just a small, small, small thing. Yeah. So small criticism that you, towards the end of your paper, you said enjoying the literature. Mm -hmm. Maybe instead of enjoying, maybe also understand the issues. Uh, yeah. yeah, but uh, what I was like a few times in your paper that, like, you know, explain and uh, when people are reading it, what, what is the purpose of reading also? Yeah, but uh, what I wanted to stress is that it, we still wanted to keep it readable. Mm. I mean, we could have uh, made footnotes at least mm. second word, mm. but that, um, because we want to introduce this literature to an audience that, uh, that is not academic. academic. Yeah. So we try to reduce those aspects, and this is what I mean by enjoying. It should be a task but to read. Enjoy, right? Right? Yeah. 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 yeah, okay, that's true. So uh, maybe one more, one last uh, question so to the translator, um, and then we'll have to close the panel. Um, well, uh, is the sh are the short forms like poetry and short stories dominant in Dalit literature, or is it just an impression I got through the works that were, that were actually mentioned? It's a pleasure um, for um, Arun and I to have this opportunity to do what we do with Sharon uh, quite often, which is to have a conversation, uh, either in Pune or Toronto or here. Uh, one of the things we have enjoyed doing is having conversations with Sharon. So this is one more of those. Uh, just by way of beginning, they both said, keep it short, get into the questions for the conversation. So there's no big introduction. He refused to read a paper. It just occurred to me as uh, we were listening, enjoying listening to the last... Uh, I'll turn this on. Is this a as I was listening to the um, last uh, session, an incident, uh, I was reminded of an incident that happened to Arun and I in Kerala. We, were, we took a three-wheeler to go from the hotel to the train station. And the driver said, where are you from? He said, from Canada. He heard Kannada, and he charged us less than he would have charged if it had been <laughs> <laughs> and the, the other, other uh, anecdote that uh, came to my mind listening to Stephanie talk about German silver is a sweet in Bengal. Uh, my Bengali friends would know Lady Kenny. Yeah. It's a it's a big dark colored sweet. It's deeply a wrong fried. Jam. It's not it's 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 a wrong it's a dark no. gulab jamun. How did it get the name Lady Kenny? Lady Kenny loved it. That's right. It yes. was uh, prepared by a sweet ma maker uh, in honor of the wife of the Governor General Lord Canning. So if you couldn't say Canning, it became Lady Kenny. <laughs> so, and the point I make, I'm making is uh, that we, certainly in India, but all over, live in and through translation all the time. Yeah. We live in, through, in and through translation. We don't recognize it because it is such a part of our life. We tell mythic stories. We tell folklore. And we don't remember that there were Aesop's fables that were transmitted to us through translation. They became part of us. We talk about Mahabharat Raman, uh, stories of the Puranic stories. We read them, in the, read them as children in the vernacular, but they were not 
in those languages. So translation is very much a part of us. And, and what I'd like to do, since we are talking about translation as a discipline, as a field, with certain particular <coughs> with a particular focus, what I thought we might do with uh, Sharon is uh, demystify this whole business of translation a bit and, and have him reflect on his experience of translation as, a, as an author. We have been talking about this act of translation mostly as practitioners who translate, as theorists who theorize about it, but what about the writer whose works we are talking about, whether it's Udhulaji or Sharanji, what about them? Um, just to lead into that, a couple of points. Both uh, Arun and I had our introduction to translation um, in, the, in this way of actually engaging in translating text uh, through a Hindi magazine um, uh, called Hans. And Laura, you mentioned Hans. Uh, Rajan Yadav, the editor, was a good friend, and he started publishing translations of uh, works from different languages in Hindi and gave quite a bit of attention to the literature. So it's interesting how these pieces happen. So I'm going to lead off with Sharon with a, with a qu couple of questions, and then Arun is going to follow up specifically about some of the features <coughs> of Dr. Mashi. Uh, and we have this multilingual conversation, <laughs> always. He will talk in English, he will flip back to Hindi, and one of us will translate it. So, first question. Hindi mein bolen kya Hindi mein puchiye, na Angreji puchiye. Main Angreji mein bata dunga. Ek lekhak ki hai asiyat se, jo ek kare karta bhi hai. Aapke liye Dalit Sahitya ke anivar ka kya mahatwa hai? Itna hi pehla. Itna hi pehla. The question is, as a writer who is also an activist, what is the importance of translation for you? Translation empowered doubled me and strengthened me because I am regional author, not national author or international author. I am regional author, writing in regional language. When my work came into in translation, it doubled me. My, uh, my dreams doubled, my efforts doubled, my work doubled, and my aspiration is doubled. Uh, reader is important. Uh, there is an uh, audience, there is a target group, there is an audience before me. I am writing for specific audience. Uh, there is a high cost audience. We want to tell our problems. We want to tell our pains, pangs to the high cost audience, to high cost readers. These are our problems. These are our pains. Listen you. You are ignored us. You are neglected us. And you, you are not uh, heard us. So we are alerting you. We are warning you. We are human beings. These are our problems. You read it and correct it. This is the intention behind my writing. Indian regional languages. And three books are appeared in English languages. There is a variation uh, in, my, in my expression. Uh, what happened? Indian, Indian translation. Uh, what happened? Uh, I, when I was writing in my regional language in Marathi, I was thinking only about my caste, uh, about my region, and about other say, say, Dalit caste. I am not aware of another uh, region, another language, and another caste, who, what they are struggling, what they are writing. Because of translation, I came to know there are authors in Hindi, there are authors in Bangla, there are authors in Tamil, there are authors in Malayalam. 
and there is also caste struggle. Hundreds of books in Gujarati. Hundreds, of, hundreds, uh, hundreds people are struggling against caste system. Not only in, this is not in only Maharashtra. Uh, I was limited in only one language. Translation uh, uh, free me from cage, and I joined with another region, another regional literature. What uh, what happened? This translation gave model to the other Dalits. When translation occurred in Hindi, Hindi Dalit authors read and they take inspiration from this. When translation appeared in Malayalam uh, of Baba Sahib Ambedkar, then people are ready. Uh, this translation uh, is an important document, important socio-political document. Uh, it is not a literary document. When Maya Pandit translate, when you translate, the translation is not book. This is a model of Dalit, uh, Dalit work. And people read, oh, this is the model. We have to follow, we have to read, and we have to write uh, such a literature. This translation empowers Dalit literature, Indian Dalit literature movement. Uh, Hindi, Hindi writers are writing, Tamil writers are writing, Malayalam writers are writing, and their common dialogue is starting. Before the translation, only we are uh, talking in our language. When, when the translation uh, when the translation came, appear, uh, then whole Indi Indian languages, there is a movement of whole Indian authors. Uh, I am talking to Hindi authors, I am talking to Malayalam authors, I am talking to Bangla authors, and uh, I, I, I became an Indian author. Indian uh, I have become a member of Indian community. This happened because of translation. And I came to know the caste face of India. I am talking about translation. Not, no, I am talking about, about uh, face of social face of translation. Not I am talking about translation. I am talking about social face of translation. Now, what is the, this social face? Uh, the whole India uh, 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 has a caste face and a very uh, very cruel face. I uh, explained slow. And. Uh, 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 again, I came to know what Dalit, uh, before when I am writing in Marathi, I know only uh, Dalits are in Hindu. We are only attacking Brahminism. Brahminism is not only one uh, enemy of us. This uh, translation, you enlighten me. There are many, there are Dalit, there are many castes in Dalits. Dalit, Dalits are in many castes. Dalit are in many castes, Dalit are in many regional languages, Dalit are in many states, and Dalit are in many religions, and Dalit are in many countries. This is the real picture. Only we are talking Brahman and Dalit, Brahmin and Dalit. There are Dalit in Krishna, there are Dalit in Muslim, there are Dalit in Sikh, there are Dalit in Buddh, Buddhism and there are Dalit in Hinduism. So many uh, Dalits, uh, scattered Dalits, and not Dalits are in not India, Dalits are in Pakistan, Punjab, Sri Lanka, Nepal, Myanmar, UK, USA, Caribbean countries, Australia, in Australia, there are scattered Dalits. How we define all this community under one uh, word? So, uh -huh. so, so translation gives you a broader, broader network of uh, yeah. thinking. Uh -huh. And English translation. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about Indian language, the translation of Indian languages. Mm -hmm. Now, when I appeared in English, I was when I was in Hindi, only half of India is talking with me. Only four, five states of India they are talking with me. When I appeared in English, then whole India is talking to, with me. Mm -hmm. uh, I before when I am in Hindi, only four or five states are inviting me. Mm -hmm. When I <laughs> when I appear in English, all I, I am getting invitation from whole India. Yeah. And uh, happen, what happened? Uh, I get invitation from Australia. Mm -hmm. I go, I went uh, Melbourne, Sydney, 
एंड आई मेड देयर ऑफ ओरिजिनल राइटर्स एंड देयर एक्सपीरियंस एंड वाई एक्सपीरियंस इज सिमिलर नेटिव नेटिव ऑथर्स फर्स्ट सिटीजन ऑथर्स एंड दलित ऑथर्स देर इज अम सिमिलरिटी वी आर ओनली टॉकिंग अबाउट ब्लैक ब्लैक ऑथर्स दलित ऑथर्स एंड ब्लैक ऑथर्स बट देर इज अ वन horizon there is a one another field a known field that is aboriginal literature uh, when i came to canada uh, 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 alok uh, spent huge money for for visiting <laughs> places and uh, to meet uh, native authors i came to know there are native authors canadian authors and they are writing again i came to know there is a literature of diaspora this is a literature of diaspora native literature dalit literature there are three pages and there are uh, dalits in muslim dalits sikh dalits christian dalit hindu dalit bahut dalit all are, there is a very large uh, uh, span so in when i was writing in marathi only one uh, only one uh, one state is in front of me and i am uh, uh, i am frog in tan mm -hmm. but now i came to know uh, i came to know there are many groups many people who are struggling who are protesting and who are uh, against, wage against war against injustice i again uh, i have some uh, i have again rethink about literature feminism they also inspire me feminism diaspora uh, aboriginal blacks and the list this mixture makes me rethink me and now it is the time to redefine uh, our ideology okay we'll get as you can see our conversation so always we need to ask him a small question prabhu you are going to ask him a question well i was just going to take on you said never for entertainment i think hindu is a very uh, entertaining novel but in a very different sense it is a detective story yes 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 <laughs> this is the text that yeah 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 arun ji nahi nahi arun ji told a real thing and i what happened i am uh, 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 dalit literature is uh, one way writing only they are protect pro they are uh, they are producing only literature of protests and now i am uh, writing again detective novel mm -hmm. but it is not detective novel it is i i use the form of detective uh, novels but you have a purpose ha uh, yeah i have a purpose <laughs> the lit author can use this uh, 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 form effectively I uh, was going to add that you also modify the detective fiction form yeah. by telling your readers uh, in the very first pages this is a murder who committed it <laughs> and then <laughs> right and, and then uh, you keep the reader uh, you know totally engaged because you keep shifting the lens uh, different people you know how uh, manik jam gopi jam they're trying to make money out of you know yeah. um, bribing and you know blackmailing the family um, people who murdered him and yeah, yeah. you know that our, the dalit yeah. perspectives our so yeah. form is entertaining form is it but our enemy uh, my enemy is uh, definite uh, my enemy is visual i know my murderer i know my enemy <laughs> ha so i explain he is my murderer and i start from that point my writing please feel free to join in this conversation <laughs> <laughs> yeah no and i want to remind you you said uh, they are very inspiring words for me uh, in the other aesthetics um, that why does the world just go crazy about beauty there is beauty in justice and beauty in anger so yeah. to me that's the beauty you bring in uh, hindu uh, the beauty of anger beauty of justice 
and that made me rethink, you know, this whole idea of aesthetics and, and you know, beauty, um, you know, how it is considered detached and, you know, contemplative and so on. And you said anger for justice is yes. beautiful. But uh, aesthetic is a, 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 in first place, we are talking about aesthetic, different aesthetic. But after I realize that aesthetic is a conspiracy from high caste. <laughs> 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 they, uh, they want to engage with this, uh, uh, with this field. Uh, we come to know. We, uh, it is the business of criti critics. They, they can criticize my uh, books. Uh, by way of ascetics, by way of Marxist, by way of Americanism, by way of Kalkanism. It is his business. My business is that, my work is that, to write for uh, Dalits. Uh, I, then I ignore the theory of aesthetics and I only concentrate on theory of uh, eradication of caste. And eradication caste of eradication of caste is of uh, aesthetics. Yes. Sharan. Yeah. Um, when you write, you, you just now said I write for Dalits. Probably you know uh, your writing is more important for the non-Dalits. Yeah. To particularly you know because most of the Dalit, it is an experience. Yeah, I agree that other Dalit readers will share that experience. But I think it's extremely important now in India, no, that writing... No, no, before, I am writing for four decades. For two decades, before four, three decades, it is important to write for high caste uh, group. Uh, now, nowadays, it is not important. Uh, before, two, three decades, before two decades, we cannot reach in the mind of high caste person. Because we have no entry in their home. How can we reach in their bedroom then? This is the only. Um, uh, this is the only. Uh, this is only one media uh, through book. I can reach in the bedroom of high caste. Uh, so we, uh, one, one, one minute. Uh, uh, I, one minute. I will tell you. And I. Kitchen. Kitchen. And. No, maybe we get injury. Through literature, and we reach there, and we talk there. But at that time, our community is uneducated. But now our community is educated, and what happened? Uh, my my childrens, they are come from convent. When they uh, write, when they read Akramasi and uh, Aidar and Boluta, they they. We uh, became angry and they, they, they are telling, this is a uh, this is a false story. Because Dr. Baba Ambedkar struggled for water uh, in Chaudar Tade's lake. But in my room, in my flat, today in my flat, there is a tap in kitchen, there are two taps in kitchen, there are three taps in uh, bathroom, there are one tap in so, toilet. How and there are two taps in garden. How can you believe my uh, uh, children that Dr. Ambedkar is uh, struggle for uh, water? This is a this is a new new generation, and they they want new type of literature. We are uh, our literature was uh, de uh, depend upon old old experiences, old history. Uh, and we are talking about old, the pain of old generation. Now the world is changed. Uh, uh, now subjects are changed. And our target group also changed. Uh, now we are part of their home. No, no, no. We are part of their home, their life. The list are not marginalized. Now we are, we are captured the post of from Pyun to uh, Mr. We are, we are Minister, so, President, President of India. Well, well, no, no, I am, I, I, this is a conspiracy, I told before this, this is a conspiracy, totally conspiracy. We, we will not follow the way of uh, aesthetics. We follow the way of Dr. Ambedkar and we want to eradicate this caste system. This is our aesthetics to finish the uh, caste system.
are without being politically correct or whatever are our numbers of enemies increasing are they decreasing are they changing face I also want to add to this. You to said you are a, an ambedkar, right? So now what is the task? Yeah. In India especially, we see that caste stares at us from every corner, from every nook. And then this caste is to be removed only from the high caste. What about the people who are in the caste? They also have to think in a different way. Don't you think so? No, no. Uh, it is my thinking. Caste system is changed. Uh, we are changing. We don't uh, uh, take this in negative uh, mood. Uh, if we develop negative dialogue, then it creates frustration. Then it creates ter terrorist thoughts among youth. We take uh, we have to we have to take U turn and we interpret our whole history. Uh, uh, present and future uh, in affirmative uh, mood. Uh, uh, the Hindu people should uh, uh, accept Dalit in affirmative, in, uh, affirmative mood and Dalit should uh, accept Hindu in affirmative mood. Uh, uh, you see, there are uh, stains on the face of uh, Woman, huh? uh, what Gandhi told uh, the caste is a stain, stigma on the face of India, uh, on the face of our country. Uh, Dalits are clearing, washing the, these things. Uh, we are doing the work up uh, on behalf of all Indians. Hindu should take, should, Hindu should, Hindu uh, progressive and orthodox uh, Hindus should. Uh, accept uh, our this effort in uh, in affirmative mood. Uh, uh, we are we are doing their work. This is a not only Dalit's work. It is a work of Dalit as well as Hindus. This is a collective work to uh, clean our uh, community, to clean our nation, uh, and we build a new nation, a beautiful nation. Uh, only Dalits are doing this work. And Hindus are, uh, 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 are opposing us. You know, we are doing your work. Uh, we are uh, cleaning your country. We are, uh, uh, we are building your nation uh, uh, more beautiful. Why you are killing us? Why are you, why are you are opposing us? This is uh, uh, my thing. Uh, Hindu, Hindu should take uh, uh, Hindu should take this uh, uh, Dalit literature in affirmative mood and wish Dalit should also uh, put in mind the Hindus are progressive. Uh, there are many progressive people who support us, who support Dr. Ambedkar. Mabichi Tis, Manavan Kede, Pula Desh Pandey, Narar Kurundkar, Gamba Sardar, Takati, Talakshim Shasi Doshi, Bhalchandra Phadke, Maya Pandit, Alok Mukherjee. These are all our progressive high caste people. Don't, I would say, not high caste, but they are progressive Hindus. Now, this is bad. I refuse to be called a Hindu. No, no, no. Progressive people. I call myself No, bigger progressive people, their help, their sanction, their contribution makes fruitful to go ahead us. Without their help, uh, wait, wait, uh, without their help, we cannot uh, speed, we cannot take speed. You know, of the Dalit movement of our country, of a new nation that we need to build up along the lines of, you know, Ambedkar, he in fact, constitution he wrote. Okay, but the last paragraph of the constitution, I would like to draw your attention to that. You know, he says this entire edifice will collapse unless we do one, two, three, four, five. I won't go into the details mm -hmm. of that. Now, in connection with that, I want to ask you a question. Uh, we see that on the one hand, what Kaveri and probably identity politics 
So, so, so how, what's I your want take to, on that? Yeah, I want to read a piece from the interview we had uh, mm -hmm. in this book. Because my question, one of my questions to him was the role that Dalits and non-Dalits, upper caste, uh, Hindu, non-Hindu, uh, have in the movement uh, to eradicate caste. And his answer was uh, that progressive-minded people who made a large contribution to the Dalit movement, reflecting on the past, are no longer with the Dalit movement. They used to join every agitation initiated by the Dalit movement <coughs> and work on issues concerning Dalits because there weren't too many Dalits working on these issues. But today, there are many Dalit activists and leaders working for Dalit concerns. Dalits are waging their own struggles. They no longer ask progressive people to work on Dalit issues because now they have their own independent organizations. Progressive people also played a paternalistic role. That was the point uh, he made um, when we had this interview. They came to Dalits in the same way that Christian missionaries approached Adivasis. Instead of a missionary approach and mentality, that is, we have come to lift you up, they ought to have said, we are coming with you. You are the leaders and we are your activists. So he was talking about the relationship in terms of your point of identity politics. What is the right relationship in the Dalit movement between the Dalits and the non-Dalits? Because what I understood you to be saying in that interview was, it's not exclusively a Dalits movement. It is our collective movement. But there are specific roles to play and the leadership has to come from the Dalits. The non-Dalits are allies, comrades, working side by side, but not the leaders. But see, Alok, there is a problem in that position because the moment you talk about Dalitism and when we converted to Buddhism, you are no more Dalits in that sense. Look at the terrific reactions that uh, Urmila received on the Gaidan for calling it a Dalit. Uh, you are not remain Dalit. We are trying to lift them. Why you people not come? That's right? Yeah, and you say the gaps which are being yeah. created. Yeah. Okay, okay. But who is they trying to lift up? Who is, who, who? How many people are trying to? Yes. Because we are trying to come up. And yes. people are, don't want to come up. Mm -hmm. up. Yesterday you see, you saw the film. Yesterday also you saw. We want to uh, live nicely. We want to uh, educate. We want to be uh, better life, but nobody wants that. We, they hate us. So there are murders. So there are um, Kerlanji. So there is uh, um, Kaulapada. And many things I in Maharashtra we face. Why it is there? No, no, no. We try to love. I want, to, love. Like, I want to get us back to the yeah, question. Yeah, uh, the question, <laughs> yes, yeah. we, can, we can carry on the debate about sure. Okay. The Dalit issues and what's the, you know, the relationship between annihilation of caste and identity politics. But given that this is Dalit literature and in translation, I want to get him back to the question of translation. Translators ने बात की है कि translator एक लेखक के हिसाब से आप अपने अनुवादों को का चुनाव कैसे या किस आधार पर करते हैं कौन आपके हिसाब से एक सफल या अच्छा अनुवादक होता है I cannot choose my translator translator choose my work to translate translator मगर यदि आप चुनते हैं कैसा अनुवाद First, I want to reply this yeah. question, then I will go there. Uh, and this is a translation is a one-way topic, I think. Uh, uh, when it, it will uh, become quality translation, when translator choose book. Uh, it, is, it is the need of, uh, it, is a, it is a need of translator, not need of author. Translation can choose the book. Translation can contact the author and translation can translate the book. Uh, uh, if 
author uh, author one uh, ask translator please do my uh, translation it is not a healthy way uh, and uh, there is a not healthy translation translation is a not a business translation is not a work translation is a passion translation i this is a vessel drunk translator is a drunkard mm -hmm. uh, he uh, live without uh, he can't survive he can't live without translation it is his uh, life passion and uh, he chose authors and his work i am asking somebody and do something and this trans this type of translation is a only a translation it is not passion there is no involvement only they are converting data converting uh, so uh, this is the one one way traffic uh, the offer should come from translator not from author i think the um, outcast by santosh bunkar <coughs> Akarmashi by Dr. Ransube. So, how do you feel when these translators take out big chunks of your writing uh, from the original uh, Marathi? Uh, because, you know, when I first read this, I didn't know anything about, uh, I mean, the, the whole page about uh, how you started writing Dalit literature. Who were your inspirations? All of that has been taken out from here, as well as from here. So until I read your original, I didn't know what they took out. Why? Why? You know, like, why did they do this? I believe in content. Ah. I am honest, our translator should be honest with content. I don't care language, style. I want to convey my message. Message is important, not language, not style. But the editor, the publisher, they are, uh, they are uh, uh, very careful about authenticity of language. Uh, authenticity of style, but they are not aware, they are not careful about the content. And he assigned the task to the uh, translator, who is Habunkar. And when he is translating Akarmasi, he, uh, he feels that he, this book is abusing to him, to his culture, to his language, to his life. Uh, he, this uh, work uh, threatening him. Then he became uh, he become loose. He uh, lo lost his confidence. He was uh, only uh, tra tra translating poems. Uh, the Dalit uh, translator uh, of uh, poems, translator of short stories, translator of other uh, uh, literature cannot be translator of Dalit literature. Dalit the translator of the literature is a different translator. He is a progressive translator. He knows the moment and he, he translates because of his commitment. Not uh, he did, because of his commitment. And he, uh, he translated, uh, I think he joined, uh, he joined this force. And he want to strengthen this force. Huh? Comrade, I am coming with you. Let us, we will go ahead. This is the feeling of translator. The progressive translation can translate the literature in an uh, authentic way. The translator, who is the only trans translator, cannot do justice to the literature. Uh, the translator of the literature has a uh, different mind, different uh, ability of understanding. Uh, this, uh, uh, this ability did not have uh, uh, from any translation. No, no, no. There should be progressive person. There should be committed person. What is the in real Akarmashi? Uh, the names are similar. My uh, name of uh, grandmother is Chanda. My brother, name of brother is Chandrakant. 
and my Bhadita uh, Naura, uh, uh, husband of my sister, is also Chandrakan. Uh, the Marathi author can understand the different names, so many different names. There, there are many names, similar names. <laughs> So, this is, so, so it seems to me, uh, I, I think the wine is waiting. Um, and the writers and translators afterwards. But we did start 15 minutes in all sessions have been starting. Like, uh, within India and outside, you know, his texts are taught in the universities. Uh, I think the point that I'm hearing him say is uh, the text that he wrote when he was 25 years old, Akramashi, it was one text produced in one condition. 20 years later, when the text gets translated, it's a different text under different conditions. And he makes a political judgment to agree to certain changes. So uh, essentially then you have got different, not just different versions, uh, but different texts under the same mark. You are worrying about my books. I am worrying about my movement. Yeah. This is the difference. Okay. <laughs> That's a good point. That to how she write and how how she live and you know, who are you? I uh, said that. So like that there was con uh, controversial thing and this attitude again there are in the so Dalit women not coming ahead to write boldly. My thinking is her every woman has write boldly. When she will write boldly. When she will close her all things, open her all things, and, uh, and open her experience, that time we will know what she is suffering, what, how she is suffering, how she is uh, um, behind, why she is behind that. So, so um, only, I think that only one, and Maya also knows, that uh, only one I am reader, I am a writer, writing boldly, but none of any uh, writer uh, dare to uh, write like that. It is a very bad thing for literature. It is a bad thing for history. I think that. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. Rapchala Mada Sapnati Chaitiwa Bashi Asa Vata Kutha. पर पढ़ाए वाट्टा इट्स नोट पर नाव ये इट इज वेरी डिफिकल्ट टू रीड आल्सो आई राइट बिफोर फोर्टी इयर्स आई नाउ देर इज अ ह्यूज गैप बिटवीन दिस बुक एंड मी यू मीटिंग एन ओल्ड फ्रेंड ओल्ड फ्रेंड या शरण लाइक गांधी यू आर चेंजिंग योर ओपिनियन माझ्या डोसक्यात कोण जायचा विचार आला भूत लागायची भीती वाटत होती राजच्याला मन स्वप्नात येईल छातीवर बसी वाटत होत पर पाय वाटच नव्हती मला ऐसाव्याच्या जवारीचा ढीक बोलत होता मी मला माग गेलो नाही मी त्या जवारीचा ढीक वटीत घेतला and gara gara wale wale dhum thoplo. I was wandering idly and alone through the village when a funeral procession approached from the opposite direction. I thought of running away as I was always scared that a ghost might haunt me. What if I dreamt of that corpse? Or um, if it sat on my chest? But I found I was trapped and there was no way to escape. Ramba was blowing the horn, uh, Jantingya was beating a drum, crackers were burst at the head of the procession, and at the rear, women followed, weeping. The dead body drew closer and closer to me. 
Coins were hurled at him. The smell of eucalyptus oil was in the air. I felt afraid. A five pesa coin came rolling my way. I picked it up quickly, though I was nervous about taking such money. I looked around to make sure that I had not been observed. The thought of more money uh, tempted me uh, to join the procession. Umbra and Parsha, too, were part of the crowd. Once again, after a short rest and change of shoulders on which the beer was carried, the procession continued on its way. Ramba blew the horn. Athenia's fingers played the march for the dead on the drum. As was the custom, a handful of jawar and some coins were left at the spot where the body had been placed temporarily. I was tempted by the sound of Jawar, uh, by, by the mound of Jawar that had been left there. I didn't follow the procession. I picked up the Jawar and ran home like the wind, calculating how many times Santa Mai would kiss me and also wishing that rich people would die every day. <laughs> ನಾನು ಮುಂಗಾಲ ತುದಿ ಬೆರಳುಗಳ ಮೇಲೆ ನಿಂತು ಇಣುಕಿ ದೇವರ ರೂಪವನ್ನು ಕಂಡಷ್ಟು ಕಲಿಯುತ್ತೇನೆ ಹತ್ತಾರು ತಲೆಗಳ ನಡುವೆ ಹೊಳೆಯುವ ಮುಕುಟ ಮಣಿ ಮೆತ್ತನೆಯ ಹಾಸ ಆಗಿ ಬೆಳೆದು ಛತ್ರಿಯಾಗುವ ಫಣಿ ಒಮ್ಮೆ ವಜ್ರ ಖಚಿತ ಕಿರೀಟ ಕಂಠೀಹಾರ ಜನಿವಾರ ದೀಪದಾರತಿ ಬೆಳಗಿ ಘಂಟಾನಾದ ಮೊಳಗುವಾಗ ಕಾಲ ಕೆಳಗಿನ ಚರ್ಮದ ಚಪ್ಪಲಿಗಳು ಕಾಲ ಕಬ್ಬಿಣವಾಗಿ ನೆಲ ಕುಸಿಯ ತೊಡಗಿ ಹಸಿ ಒಡಲು ಉರಿ ಹತ್ತಿ ಬೇಯುತ್ತದೆ ಸ್ಯಾಂಡಲ್ಸ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಆಲಿ when i go to the temple i don't leave my sandals outside i stay outside myself sandals on a cobra's feet are news as rare as a man biting a dog all the legs that leave their sandals surge over me the ground pours away my damp body burns with flames. I'm like the faithful Garuda column, keeping its distance. I throw incense in a pot of embers in front of it, and when smoke rises, I feel grateful. The people who go near the gods, offering money, perambulating, sometimes look at me without betting an island. My mind is only on God. They receive flowers and sandal paste in the sanctum, but their souls are with the shoes they left outside. <laughs> As I stand every day on the porch, craning my neck and peeking, my soul, becoming pure, is near the gods inside. Yenne kaana de siru bitta kude, manna ata dinda masira nai, harida virida vandangi, hetta vada muddu kodangi. ಕಣ್ಣ ಹಟ್ಟಿ ದಾರಿ ಗುಂಟ ನಡುವ ಮೇಲಿದ್ದ ಪುಟ್ಟ ತೋಳುಗಳಲ್ಲಿ ಕತ್ತ ಬಳಸಿ ಜಗುಲಿ ಮೇಲೆ ಕುಳಿತು ಮಗನ ರವಿಸುವುದು ಮೊದಲು ಆಮೇಲೆ ಕಮನೆಗೆಲಸ ಫಿಲ್ಟರಿಂಗ್ ಆಶ್ ದ ಲೈಟ್ ಫೇಸ್ ಸ್ಲೋಲಿ ಅಂಡ್ ದ ಸನ್ಸ್ ಐಸ್ ಬ್ಯಾಂಕ್ಸ್ ವಿಲ್ಟಿಂಗ್ ಲೈಕ್ ಲೀವ್ಸ್ ದ ವರ್ಕರ್ಸ್ ಮೇಕ್ ದ ವೇ ಟು ದ ವಿಲೇಜ್ ಅಮಂಗ್ ದೆಮ್ ಲೈಕ್ ಎ ಕೌ ರಿಮೆಂಬರಿಂಗ್ ಅ ಕಾಫ್ ಶಿ ದ ಮದರ್ ಅರ್ ಹಾಮ್ ಆರ್ಮ್ಸ್ ಲೈಕ್ ಫೆದರ್ಸ್ a sari length the tail chatters like a bird come this way come that way come softly beckoning her with words and uh, i will present different kinds of poems which i have been uh, writing in english for glide slide swinging like a casting wind a boat on the river with colorful fish yellow and green flash on the shining water moves quickly disappearing with the flow water doesn't know air doesn't know tree doesn't know fish doesn't know water air tree fish no 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 none of them no this game of hide and seek ಒಂದು ಎಲೆ ಹಾಗೆ ಮೆಲ್ಲಗೆ ಮರದಿಂದ ಜಾರುತ್ತ ತೇಲುತ್ತ ಗಾಳಿಪಟವಾಗುತ್ತ ಗಾಳಿಯ ಮೈದಡಲಿ ಜಾರುತ್ತ ನೀರ ನೀರು ದೋಣಿಯಾಗಿ ಜಸ್ಟ್ ಫ್ಲೋ ಇನ್ ಅನೇಬಲ್ ಟು ಫ್ಲೋ 
munches on the story of darkness in the darkness of the night no hatred no smoldering no they us or you and we all along the pathway dreams blossom create new worlds every moment ಬೆಳಕಿ ನೂರಿಂದ ನಡೆದು ಬಂದ ನೆರಳುಗಳು ಕತ್ತಲಲ್ಲಿ ತಮ್ಮ ರೂಪು ರೇಷೆ ಕಳಕೊಂಡು ದಗೆ ಹಾಗೆ ಕಳಚಿಟ್ಟುಗೆ ನೀರಿಗೆ ನೀರು ಬೆರೆತಂತೆ ಒಂದರಲ್ಲೊಂದು ಬೆರೆತು ಕರಗಿ ಕತ್ತಲಲ್ಲಿ ಕತ್ತಲಾಗಿ ಕರೆಯುತ್ತದೆ ಕತ್ತಲಾಚೆಗೆ ಕಾಲಿಟ್ಟದ್ದೆ ತಡ ನೆರಳ ಕಾಲ ಬುಡಕ್ಕೆ ಅಷ್ಟುದ್ದ ಬೆಳೆದು ನಿಂತ ಅಕರಾಳ ವಿಕರಾಳಗಳು ಮೊಲೆ ಕಳಚಿಟ್ಟು ಮುಚ್ಚಿಟ್ಟು ಲಿಂಗ I know it's a bit of a maybe clumsy and old-fashioned way to communicate with people and we're working on a, on a blog, you know, home website, you know, which will be more interactive, but I, I quite like my, my email subscription list, you know, it's, a, it's just it's a nice and direct way and then you can respond to me and some of you really enjoy responding to everybody. So, um, <laughs> you know, so, so this is sort of the immediate future and Considering that it's been going so well, um, we're, we're certain, we'll certainly try to get more funding. Mm -hmm. you know, there are more funding bits planned and also other events in the pipeline, you know, which we will kind of inform you in due course as long as we have sort of more, you know, firmer plans. You know, not postponed, but it's kind of, you know, I realize, you know, if, if we kind of take on a bit too much, then everything kind of moves a bit too slowly. So there is a special issue that is planned, and we have um, almost sort of a complete selection of essays. But you know, because there were two um, withdrawals, we are very happy. You know, if someone would like to you know, offer us a piece for this special issue for a for a sort of a very sort of standard post-colonial journal, the Journal of Commonwealth Literature, you know, if, if you think that you have a, an essay that is right for that type of